what are the most common uh, mistakes you see in art? Um, and also, how do you think people misinterpret a statement that you often made that art is a translation of reality? Because I find it a very flexible thing, whereas people often delimit themselves and what they think by that. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at. Uh, can you restate? I, yeah, I can, I can rephrase it. So what are the most common mistakes you see in art in terms of, say, you know, repetition, say, um, say, well, in, in, rating, say all sorts of things like that. And then also, uh, people take that statement of yours art is a translation of reality and they delimit the reality. They, they make it something that reality can be kind of diegetic. It doesn't necessarily have to be confined just to earthbound things. So well, how do you, how do you think that's a, do you agree with me that it's a very flexible thing? In, in most all, ways? all art, uh, and especially writing, the worst thing is cliches. People just, just fall into them without even realizing it. People think in cliches. When I argue with people, they argue in cliches. Uh, people want to have cliches in their art because when you try to explain why something doesn't work or why a character doesn't work, just as, I mean, people, I, I was arguing with people online about this soap opera and people make up things about characters that other millions of people didn't see, but because they happened 25 or 30 or, or more years ago, they think, well, I can just re retool the storyline or the history of this show to suit my whims. And it's one thing that they want to have that fan fiction approach to it. But, but, you know, I, I say, stop telling people things about what happened in this show that didn't happen uh, because you're, you're robbing them from a, an enjoyment of it. But people don't even think of those sorts of things. So cliches are the biggest, uh, are the biggest problem uh, in poetry, for example, and jamming. People don't seem to, have any clue as to why a line needs to break. And when you're reading a poem too, you should slightly hesitate at a break. Uh, people read poetry the way they read prose. And there's no, uh, why would you break it into line unless there's a reason for it? Um, and as to the second half of it was a what again? Was the misinterpretation of translation of, of reality as a trend. Oh. As art as a translation of reality. I don't think I don't think people misinterpret that. I don't think I think I'm probably the only person that's really come up with that. I mean, I've heard a few people uh, talk about uh, art dealing with reality here, or there, but I don't think that's even a major vein. In I mean, if you were to look at all the books, all of the philosophers who have written about art, all of the the people who write handbooks about whatever art form, I don't think any of them. More, more than maybe 1% uh, even deals with that as an idea. So I, I just don't think it has, it's occurred to people. I don't think it's a willful misinterpretation. It just simply hasn't occurred to most people. I, I don't know why. It seems obvious to me, and it seemed obvious to me long before I even became a great poet. Um, you know, art is something to help you understand a little bit. Like I said, if you understand what... what uh, identify with some character, good, bad, or indifferent, it helps you understand a bit of yourself. If if some story deals with a topic thematically or it plot-wise that you're familiar with, it helps you maybe reconcile something that happened to you. But most people just don't seem to get that. I don't know why it seems obvious, but I, I couldn't tell you why. It does seem obvious. I was talking about it more generally. I, I agree it hasn't occurred to people. It's not out there in the public conscious as an idea. I was merely meaning how people take that and they'll delimit it. They'll they'll twist it to whatever they mean. So Ray Carney is a good example where he thinks that all of New York is just filled with garbage, yet the Woody Allen New York never occurs to him. It's just the John Cassavetes New York or the or what have you. The all only ones who deal with you know the the worst of reality rather than dealing with different angles and the comic aspects perhaps of reality. Yeah. And then let's talk about your three intellects. Pause. We briefly mentioned it in the interviews, but I wanted to ask you: Who do you think are some of the past visionaries uh, of of earlier days, and and why? Um. Uh, in poetry, is, I, there's a short list. 
In poetry, Walt Whitman is a virgin. I think I've said before, people would lump Emily Dickinson in with him, but she's almost an anti-visionary. Someone who's visionary in the arts is going to basic, basically be able to say a Whitmanian view of life, uh, a Whitmanian this or that. Dickinson doesn't really have that because a, a visionary sort of transforms by the way they allow people to experience things. Um, Dickinson brings things down. So in a sense, you could say she's a visionary and that she's an anti-visionary, but she's almost antithetical to the idea of what a visionary is. And she's not as great a poet as a lot of people make out. She's one of those poets that uh, she reminds me of, of uh, the movie Vertigo. When Vertigo first came out, people famously say, oh, it got mediocre reviews. But I've looked at some of those reviews and they actually nail a lot of what's wrong with Vertigo as a film. It's not a bad film. It's a, a good, solid film at best. It's a popcorn movie. There isn't anything really greatly deep there. There's nothing in Vertigo, for example, that touches the the 10 best movies of a Bergman or the best movies of a Cassavetes or a, a Fellini even. Um, uh, and in that way, Dickinson is... A lot of the things that people said about her, her when her poems first were published, even though they were bodlerized, still hold true. There's there's a there's a, a circular kind of rhythm, a circular kind of way she views things that becomes predictable. After you've read ten or twelve uh, poems of hers, and she's got eighteen hundred little poems, whatever it is. By the time anyone, even a, an average reader, reads. 30 or 40 poems of Dickinson, you pretty much know a bump, a bump, a bump. It's like watching a, a Catskill comic, a Borscht Belt, Jewish comedy, vaudeville, in that you know what's going to happen, but you laugh at it anyway. You know what Dickinson is going to do in a poem, but you accept it anyway because it's Dickinson, and that's the small little world she's circumscribed for herself. Um, when it comes to novels, um, uh, you know, I would certainly put... Uh, uh, someone like Twain up there. Um, he has a visionary sense, although he, again, probably doesn't have as much great stuff as is, is ascribed to him. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of his lesser stuff is uh, Twain describes something, some incident, some people, kind of wacky. He does it in a funny way. There's a little twist of fate, perhaps. And then, well, you know, I'm Mark Twain being Mark Twain. And so there is a certain formula formula to some of his lesser works, but he has enough of his great stuff that, uh, that, and, and that great stuff, whether it's Life on the Mississippi or uh, uh, Puddinghead Wilson is probably his most underrated work. That's a work that's only just a notch or, or two below Huckleberry Finn, if you want to even say that. Um, it, it's not as broad and comic, uh, and so it doesn't get its due. Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court has moments. It's not a great work itself, but it has certainly some great moments. And I, I'm missing a few other things off the top of my head, but I would certainly put him in, in that sense uh, as a visionary. And superb essayist, too. Yeah, yeah, essayist. Um, uh, I haven't really read much. I, I've only read some ports, portions of James Baldwin uh, and his, his fiction. Jessica's read a few books of his, his fiction. I've read all of his essays, though. He's more visionary in his essays, I think, than from what I've read in his fiction. Lauren Isley, certainly, as much he has a visionary outlook in his essays, not in his poetry. Um, trying to think. Uh, oh, O'Neill certainly transforms, and there's an O'Neill kind of view of the universe. Sylvia Plath as a poet, Hart Crane, Wallace Stevens, Robinson Jeffers. The poets, uh, in a sense to me, are the most easy to define as visionary or not. Um, novelists, you know, Betty Smith, is that book a visionary book? No, I wouldn't say that, but it's as great as any visionary work that I know. Um, uh, well, that's been published and put out uh, for public what consumption. What about Herman Film Melville? Her, yeah, Melville. Uh, Melville with Moby Dick, Melville uh, in Bartleby, Melville in uh, uh, Billy Budd, uh, Benito Serino. I'd even include Typey and Omu, which are sort of skeletal versions of Moby Dick in a sense. Um, uh, so, yeah, he would be up there. Um, I'm trying to think of any other 19th century English language writers. I, uh, I have a difficult time thinking of novelists. 
Dostoevsky, I don't know if I would consider Dostoevsky a visionary because Dostoevsky didn't have that grand view. Dostoevsky, in a sense, was one of these sort of political writers that everything was to serve a political purpose, despite his his claim, claims people make of his Christianity and uh, other things. He was very much more... I, I don't I don't really think of him in, in a Dostoevskyan universe. Same thing with Tolstoy. Tolstoy even more so than Dostoevsky. I've only read Tegania's Fathers and Sons. I don't remember it. It's 25, 30 years since I read that, enough to comment on it fully. Um, other than that, I would put it as a an excellent and near great novel, although you could probably make some uh, some claims for its greatness. Um, filmmakers, I, you know, Cassavetes, even in his films that fail, they're visionary in that uh, some of the reasons they fail is because they're too uh, hewed to his own vision. Um, uh, you know, something like Husbands or something like uh, uh, A Woman Under the Influence probably suffer and could have used a little less Cassavetes in them and they would have been better for it. Um, Fellini, certainly a visionary. Kurosawa, Kubrick, uh, Woody Allen, I wouldn't put as a visionary, um, even though he has some great works. Uh, Woody Allen was sort of uh, someone who took off from others' works and, and made more of it. Um, I don't think there's a particular Woody Allen-esque vision um, Terence Malick at his best early on, there was certainly a Mal Malickian uh, vision. Um, so I would say poets and filmmakers probably... Wells. Wells, too. Well, they have the most... They are the easiest, I think, to define as visionaries. Um, uh, what about Taylor Angelopoulos? Yeah, I, I think you can make a make an argument for him. Uh, you raise an interesting point. John Cassavetes, I would rank Martin Scorsese and Woody Allen above him in the pantheon of American filmmakers and then Kubrick and Wells ahead of them. Uh, I do agree that you could certainly... But neither Scorsese nor Allen are visionaries. And so it shows you that even so, though someone has yeah, is a visionary, going, it doesn't you. necessarily mean that they're better than a high creationary, which I would put Allen and Scorsese at. Because what, what's, what's really his most visionary? I don't know anything that's really... Scorsesean. I mean, Goodfellas uh, is a slick, excellent, great film about gangsters, but it doesn't have the vision that A Killing of a Chinese Bookie does. Uh, Taxi Driver, for all of its greatness, I'm not sure if that's even a visionary work. I mean, you can say Travis has his own worldview or whatnot, but I don't really think that that's a Scorsese view. Uh, yet you can see, I mean, when you go from when you go from his the, the films of the seventies that Scorsese did to his sort of experimental eighties uh, films to Goodfellas as his last great film to some good stuff in the nineties uh, that just falls short of greatness to some of the rework re pieced together stuff that I saw I think the last film of his that I watched fully was was it the Aviator I think um, Jessica watched that the Departed oh the Departed that came after the Aviator. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Jessica watched Shutter Island. I, I don't. I've not seen that cartoon he did, and I have no real interest in. Cartoon. Uh, he did a, a Waldo or something. <laughs> did, okay. I didn't know that. No, he did. He did some cartoon, some Pixar cartoon. Um, I don't know the name of it, but. Uh, Are you thinking Hugo? Hugo. Yeah, that was it. It was it wasn't a cartoon. It was a children's film. Though. Oh, okay, okay. I, um, I thought I thought there was some animation in it. Uh, it had three D. Oh, okay. Um, the Shutter Island was a, a vastly uh, undershot. Even the, part the Wolf of Wall Street doesn't interest me to see. That was his last finished film, I think. You know, mm -hmm. it looks like just watered down Casino, which was watered down Goodfellas. Yeah, you can see a, a style. Uh, it's hard to mistake a Scorsese film in at his best when Goodfellas and Taxi Driver, Mean Streets. You see a style. You don't see any kind of huge. Uh, the Cassavetes has. But style it. isn't vision alone. No. Style can be an important part of vision, but vision also has. There has to be some underlying philosophic, thematic uh, things that come together along with the style. Style, style is just sort of buffing. It's just polishing. 
I just took Jess's car in for uh, clean yesterday, but it's a since it's a 16 year old vehicle, 15, 16 year old vehicle, I'm like, I'm not going to pay $40 to get it waxed. So we only got it cleaned and vacuumed for like $13.99. But as you mentioned, uh, vision can kind of delimit everything. If it's not a wide, expansive vision, and Casavage certainly didn't have a wide, expansive vision since, since some of his films don't work because of him. Mm. Uh, it, it often delimits the art, and that is why I would put Woody Allen and Martin Scorsese ahead of him. 